The Betelgeuse supernova is one of the most anticipated astronomical events of our time. When it happens, it will light up the sky for up to a month, making it the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and full moon, and it would even be visible during the day. Absolutely spectacular, but unfortunately it's unlikely to happen anytime soon, no matter what clickbait videos like this try to tell you. Trust me, I'm disappointed as well. When astronomers say Betelgeuse is about to go supernova, they mean it will likely happen anytime between 10,000 years up to 100,000 years, which is soon in cosmic terms, keeping in mind stars shine for millions and billions of years. But compared to a human lifetime, that's very far into the future. Betelgeuse is a variable star and so it slightly increases and decreases in brightness over the course of about 400 days. This was already discovered in 1836, so it's nothing new. That being said, Betelgeuse has been behaving. In 2019, it went through what became known as the Great Dimming. For some reason, it decreased in brightness by 60%, and by February of that year, it was only about 38% of its usual brightness, much less than during its normal cycle. After that point, it returned to its usual brightness by April of 2020. Research suggests that Betelgeuse probably ejected a huge amount of gas that cooled down and obscured the star for some time. This year, however, it has actually increased in brightness up to 140% of how bright it usually is. So what does that mean? The chance that Betelgeuse goes supernova before I can finish this video is technically not zero. Unlikely, but not impossible. It could really just happen. But how will we know? And is this recent increase in brightness really a sign that it might actually blow up any given day now? To better understand what's going on in Betelgeuse, let's first talk a bit about stellar evolution. Stars are born from giant clouds of interstellar gas and dust. Gravity causes these clouds to contract and collapse, and when the pressure and temperature at the heart of such a cloud gets high enough, nuclear fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium atoms starts to happen. This releases huge amounts of energy, and a newborn star begins to shine. Depending on its mass, a star can shine for many billions of years. The more massive a star is, the shorter its lifetime. Small stars like red dwarfs have lifetimes of tens of billions up to trillions of years. A star like our sun lives for about 9 to 10 billion years, and giant stars like Betelgeuse only last for a few million years. You would think a bigger star would last longer because it has more fuel to burn through, but it's a bit more complicated than that. A star is in hydrostatic equilibrium. That means that the inward pull of gravity is balancing out against the outward push of energy coming from the fusion process. In small stars, this balance lasts for billions of years. Supergiant stars like Betelgeuse are actually less stable because of their enormous mass. Because the energy released by their fusion process is so high, they're constantly losing huge amounts of material. And so their lifespans are significantly shorter. Either way, all stars run out of material to fuse at some point. Small stars shed their outer layers as the fusion process comes to a halt. And the remaining core is called a white dwarf. The biggest stars explode in a supernova and their core collapses into a neutron star or a black hole. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky, usually the tenth brightest, but due to the recent increase, it's now the seventh brightest. It sits about 500 light years from Earth, making it the nearest red supergiant to us and has been studied since ancient times. It's a star at the end of its life. It has burned up all the hydrogen fuel in its core and has expanded hundreds of times beyond its original size. If placed in the solar system instead of the sun, it would fill up the orbit of Jupiter. The star's recent antics, including its cycle having dropped from 400 days to 200 days, makes it seem like it really could go supernova very soon. Again, soon in astronomical terms. Astronomers suspect that Betelgeuse is now fusing helium into carbon and oxygen inside its core. This is an end stage of a star's life. There is no more hydrogen to fuse into helium, and so a massive star like Betelgeuse fuses heavier elements as it becomes increasingly unstable. After all the helium is gone, the carbon and oxygen are fused into neon and magnesium, and these then become silicon. At the very end, the star's core fills up with iron, and that is when the fireworks begin. Iron atoms require more energy than is available to fuse into even heavier elements. 
and so the core of the star suddenly collapses under its own gravity. This event causes the supernova. It releases an unimaginable amount of energy, and the iron is fused further into cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and other heavy elements. All of this and the outer layers of the star that still contain lighter elements are blasted into the depths of space at over 16 million kilometers per hour. Within a day or two, the exploding star becomes brighter than a billion suns. The shockwave carries the star's remains into interstellar space, where they will eventually condense into new clouds of gas and dust, rich with lighter and heavier elements, ready to form new stars, planets, and maybe even life. When scientists say we are all made of stardust, this is what they mean. Hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium were formed in the Big Bang. With the oxygen we breathe, the iron in our blood, the phosphorus in our DNA, were forged in the dense cores of dying stars and the seething hearts of supernova explosions. Now, if Betelgeuse is in its helium fusion stage, that is still going to last for hundreds of thousands of years. The next stages of fusion are going to become shorter and shorter, from about 10,000 years down to about 1,000, then to about 100, and the final phase before the supernova happens only lasts a few days. But in the case of Betelgeuse, we're really most likely not quite there yet. As a matter of fact, some scientists suspect that the previous great dimming of 2019 may have caused some changes in the star so that now it's a bit brighter and pulsating a bit faster, but it could go back to behaving like before in the next 10 years or so and a supernova really still is many thousands of years away. I know I keep repeating myself, but it, this is just how it is. Probably. Betelgeuse can be studied in greater detail than most other stars because of its size and proximity to us. Images reveal an irregular blob with these huge, super-hot gas bubbles, the biggest the size of a small star. Enormous plumes of material rise and fall from the star's surface, much like protrusions on our own sun. Except these are so huge they make our star look like a campfire next to an erupting volcano. Using the best telescope, scientists can detect what's going on in the outer layers of Betelgeuse, and they can measure the composition of the star's atmosphere, but unfortunately that doesn't really tell us anything about what's going on in the core. It could be burning helium, but it could already be in the carbon-burning phase for all we know, so why do astronomers keep saying that it's really not due for a supernova in our lifetimes? Our knowledge of stellar evolution almost entirely depends on studying surrounding stars in all stages of their lives. It's like we're given one day to walk around in a forest and try and figure out how trees grow from looking at seeds, sprouts, young trees, mature trees, and old and dead trees. And so we can deduce how an acorn can grow into a massive oak tree without ever actually seeing this happening from beginning to end. It's similar with stellar evolution. Astronomers can make an educated guess on Betelgeuse's life phase and progress by looking at nearby supergiant stars that may be closer to going supernova. One such star is VY Canis Majoris, a dying hypergiant star and one of the biggest known stars, located about 3000 light years from Earth. Basically, it's Betelgeuse on steroids. Giant stars like this are rare, and so it's a good opportunity for astronomers to see how this massive star behaves at the end stage. VY Canis Majoris has actually become much dimmer in the past 100 years. It used to be visible to the naked eye, but the star has lost so much mass in the past century that it can only be observed in infrared light anymore. It's suspected that this star is much closer to exploding than Betelgeuse. It's estimated it has lost about 60% of its original mass, while Betelgeuse still seems to have about 95% of its initial mass. So that's a pretty good clue for when we can expect Betelgeuse to explode. Yeah, it's still not, not gonna happen any sooner. Probably. Now suppose scientists have been completely wrong and Betelgeuse actually did explode about 500 years ago and this light is going to reach us, say, sometime next week. Could we see this coming somehow? Actually, yes, but not in the way you might think. Betelgeuse might not show any signs of an imminent supernova, like suddenly brightening or suddenly dimming or blinking or something like that. Going by what we're seeing with other supergiant stars, it might just get much dimmer first, but the exact moment a supernova begins can't be predicted. A supernova happens very sudden. The moment the diminishing fusion energy can no longer counter against the star's own gravity, the core collapses and the whole star gets blown apart. 
However, the core collapse of a giant star first releases a burst of neutrinos, tiny, lightweight elementary particles that can be detected a few hours before the light of the supernova reaches Earth. The Supernova Early Warning System is a network of neutrino detectors designed to give an early warning to astronomers in the event of any supernova happening in the Milky Way or a nearby galaxy. Neutrino astronomy is a very young field in science. In fact, the neutrino was hypothesized no earlier than 1930. Scientists need to build these huge detectors because neutrinos only very weakly interact with other particles. They have no charge and barely any mass so you need a lot of space to detect a significant amount of them. On the bright side, because they barely interact with anything, they can travel through space very quickly. Other particles, like photons for instance, are often hindered by clouds of gas and dust, and stars as well. In the event of a nearby supernova, the amount of neutrinos will increase by a lot for a few seconds. So far, the only time a neutrino burst followed by a supernova explosion was detected was supernova SN1987A in the year 1987. It happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, and about three hours before the light of the explosion reached Earth, three neutrino observatories detected the neutrino burst. Now, neutrino astronomy has come a long way, and the early warning system we have could give astronomers just enough of a head start to point telescopes and instruments at the source of a burst when it happens. It could be Betelgeuse, but it could be an entirely different star much farther away. Either way, the chance to study a supernova up close is a rare occurrence. One estimate says that on average they only happen once every 50 years in our own galaxy. Astronomers of the past have taken note of several visible supernova explosions without truly realizing what they were. Ancient Chinese astronomers were known to be particularly meticulous when it came to keeping records, and as early as the year 185 they made observations of so-called guest stars, stars that suddenly appeared and disappeared again in the following months. In the year 1054 they saw a guest star that was also visible during the day for several weeks, and was visible in the night sky for almost two years. This is the supernova that formed the Crab Nebula, which sits about 6,500 light years from Earth. It's not visible to the naked eye, but can be seen with binoculars. At the heart of the nebula, there's a neutron star, the extremely dense remaining core of the exploded star. The most recent supernova humans observed in the Milky Way happened over 400 years ago, in 1604, and for a time it was brighter than any other star in the night sky. There have been many supernova explosions in other galaxies, and they have been studied extensively. They've even been used to determine the distance to those galaxies. And so we know that they are the final death rattle of massive stars, or the result of two orbiting stars merging and they're one of the main sources of heavy elements in our universe. Supernova are some of the most violent and energetic events that we know of, so if Betelgeuse explodes, is there any risk to Earth and the life on it? Luckily, even though it's very close to us in astronomical terms, we're far away enough from it that it won't pose any danger to any creature living on Earth, and all it will be is a spectacular light show. But what if it was closer? Past nearby supernova have had a profound influence on Earth and the solar system as a whole, and not just because a lot of the heavy elements in our bodies and the very ground we stand on came from them. Supernova explosions can also trigger star formation in nearby clouds of gas and dust, and so they're an important part of the cycle of star birth and rebirth. And whichever planets may develop around new stars and possible life forms developing on these planets. Life as we know it would not be possible without the elements forged in supernova explosions. Interestingly, it's suspected that nearby supernova may have influenced the biodiversity on our planet. An increase in cosmic rays can change Earth's climate, which can produce strong winds, and that increases ocean mixing, which causes more nutrients to make it to the surface, and more food is better for all life forms involved in the food chain. Well, fed life forms reproduce more, and so they can evolve faster. Cosmic radiation may also cause genetic mutations. That being said, if the supernova is too close, closer than 160 light years, the cosmic rays are too strong and will cause damage. Gamma rays cause a reaction in the atmosphere that depletes the protective ozone layer, and this exposes Earth's surface to harmful cosmic and solar radiation. 
In fact, a nearby supernova is a possible explanation for the late Ordovician extinction, which saw the death of nearly 60% of all ocean life on Earth about 443 million years ago. It was the first of the so-called Big Five mass extinction events life on our planet has been through so far. Now, to be fair, things like global cooling, extreme volcanism, and asteroid impacts are more likely to have caused the extinction. And the risk of an extinction event caused by a supernova is extremely low either way. It's estimated that a potentially dangerous near-Earth supernova happens once every 50 million years up to once every 240 million years. It could also depend on where in the Milky Way the solar system is. Our solar system orbits the center of the galaxy once every 230 million years, and as it does, it passes through these spiral arms, taking about 10 million years to do so. These regions have a higher rate of supernova explosions because there's more stars. Speaking of near-Earth supernova, Betelgeuse is but one of six nearby stars that are due to explode in as little as a thousand years. Maybe. Rigel is the other brightest star in the constellation of Orion. If Betelgeuse is the left shoulder of the hunter, Rigel is the right foot. It's a blue supergiant that sits about 860 light years from us, and its light appears blue because it's much hotter than a red supergiant. Antares is the brightest star in the Scorpion, a red supergiant about 550 light years away. Spica is the brightest star in Virgo, about 250 light years away, and is actually a binary star system. The primary star is a blue giant, the secondary star a bit larger than the Sun. They orbit so close to each other that they're X-shaped. Alpha Lupi is another blue giant and the brightest star in the constellation of Lupus, or the Wolf, and only visible from the southern hemisphere. It's about 460 light years away from us. Finally, we have Ik Pegasi, a binary star system in the constellation of Pegasus at only 154 light years from Earth. Now, that last one is an unusual candidate for a supernova because neither of the stars in the system are giants nearing the end of their lives. The bigger star is a main sequence star a bit bigger than our Sun, and the smaller one is a massive white dwarf, the glowing remaining core of a dead star. The risk with Ik Pegasi is that when the bigger star ages and becomes a red giant, the white dwarf will start to accrete matter from its companion, and at a critical amount of mass it will explode in a supernova. This is the lesser known type 1 supernova. A type 2 supernova is what we've been discussing for most of this video and is the core collapse of a giant star. Type 1 supernova are sneaky compared to type 2 supernova, because they happen in star system with much more common and much dimmer stars, and so they might not be very well studied. The good news is by the time that Ik Pegasi is estimated to blow, the solar system will have moved a safe distance away from it. None of the other supernova candidates close to Earth pose any real threat to our planet, though when they go boom, it will make for an absolutely amazing view. Sadly, it's really not possible to predict when any of these giant stars are going to explode because a core collapse happens so suddenly. Most likely, not in our lifetimes, including Betelgeuse. It's estimated that the rate of supernova in our Milky Way galaxy is between 2 and 12 per century. However, we haven't directly observed one since Kepler's supernova in 1604, so the next one could technically happen any given second, and we have observed several supernova in other galaxies, so it's just a matter of time. And it might just be visible in the night sky for casual observers. So sit back, relax, and keep an eye on astronomy news. When it happens, it will be exciting to say the least. Thank you for watching, I hope you learned something new, and I will see you in the next video.